Hi guys, Olive here, here today to discuss The House of Gucci in both its book and movie forms. The House of Gucci, a true story of murder, madness, glamour, and greed by Sarah J. Forden came out in the year 2000, and its movie adaptation came out 21 years later. As of the time I'm filming this video, the movie was actually just released. In this video, I'm going to be talking about both the book and the movie. I have experienced both of them, so that gives me the opportunity to compare the two, to talk about whether or not the movie was faithful to the book, or in this case, faithful to the true story, because it was a nonfiction book that was adapted. But I'm also going to give you my opinions on both of them, talk about whether or not I think either are worth your time, or if it would be in your best interest to experience one before the other. We're going to talk about it all. This is a book channel, so let's discuss the book first. Like I said before, this book did come out in the year 2000. It was published by William Morrow, which is an imprint of HarperCollins, and the newly issued movie tie-in paperback edition that actually contains updates on the case since the book's original publication. I received a free copy of that newly issued paperback from the publisher for reviewing purposes, and it comes in at 544 pages. I know that sounds like a scary number, but don't be intimidated. It is a long book, but a lot of those pages are endnotes where the author author is citing her sources. I'll say right away that one thing that the book and the movie definitely have in common is that there's so much going on in both of them. This is a really, really big story. And Sarah Gay Forden obviously did a tremendous amount of research for this book. But she's not very selective in the way that she presents it. Like she gives you all of the information instead of holding anything back to suit the storytelling better. Like she gives all of the information in this book, which could be good or bad, depending on what you're looking for. But because there's so much information, there was so much going on, she's kind of telling two different stories at once, hence the page count. The first one is the story of the Italian fashion house Gucci, the company Gucci, its origins in the early 20th century, how they started off making really high quality leather goods, mainly luggage, but then they moved into handbags, and shoes, and then eventually they made their way into clothing. The history of the family Gucci is discussed alongside the history of the company throughout this book, and that makes a lot of sense because for many years, Gucci was a family company. But as one character in the movie points out, a family company means family problems. And I'm actually surprised that wasn't a line pulled straight from the book because it could not have been truer in the case of Gucci. This is an Italian family. It's made up of proud, passionate people, and their squabbles over control of the company made headlines over and over again. Something else that was highly publicized was the 1995 murder of Maurizio Gucci, who was the grandson of the founder of Gucci. Maurizio was also the head of the company for a little while, and his demise was set into motion by his ex-wife, Patrizia. Maurizio and Patrizia's love story gone wrong is the other story being told in this book. These two storylines interweave as the book goes on, sometimes elegantly, other times not. And the story of what happens with the company Gucci, just because of everything that happened, the story devolves into this series of petty and repetitive power grabs, followed by Maurizio taking the wheel and driving the company directly into the ground. He held on for dear life, trying to retain control, but he was eventually forced out. Meanwhile, he and his wife Patrizia had a really good marriage at the start, but as Maurizio started to gain more control over the Gucci company, gain more confidence. He wanted more agency over his own life. And so he started to distance himself from his wife, who could be very controlling. He eventually left her. And as he started to deprive her of all the things that she thought were rightfully hers, all the perks of being a Gucci, she started to grow increasingly resentful increasingly vindictive. And eventually she hired someone to murder her ex-husband. Now, although the subtitle of this book may seem to suggest that the murder is at the center of this book, 
that is definitely not the case. The history of this company, everything that happened with the company from its founding up until the modern day at the time of publication, that's the main focus of this book. And then the family's personal affairs, I would say, would be the secondary focus. And then the murder is really third on that list. And judging by people's Goodreads reviews, I sense that has been a source of frustration over the past 21 years that this book has been out. I think people go into this book expecting one thing and they get another. I think a book's title and cover has so much to do with our expectations and our expectations have so much to do with our eventual enjoyment of a book. So I think it's a publisher's duty to correctly market a book and I don't necessarily think they did so in this case. So if you haven't read this book yet, go ahead and ignore that subtitle for me and allow me to tell you that this is much more a book about the company Gucci, about the family Gucci, and less about the murder. The murder is discussed, but this is not a true crime book, as the subtitle seems to want you to believe. This is pretty much a business history book. Maybe that has talked you into reading this book, maybe talked you out of reading this book. I think it depends on what you're interested in reading about. I find business really interesting. So I really enjoyed reading that aspect of this book. It got a little tedious because she did include so much information. But I do think reading the book prepared me to watch this movie. So now let's talk a little bit about that movie before I start comparing and contrasting the two, which is always my favorite part. So this movie came out this year in 2021, as of the time I'm filming this video, and it was directed by Ridley Scott. He's a very famous director. He's directed things like Blade Runner, Thelma and Louise, Gladiator, in addition to a lot of other big movies you have likely heard of. Ridley Scott actually optioned this book back in the mid 2000s. He knew he wanted to make a movie out of this book since it was released pretty much, but it kind of got stuck in Hollywood's jaw until things started moving again in late 2019 when Lady Gaga agreed to play the infamous Patrizia. Adam Driver plays Maurizio, Al Pacino plays the patriarch of the family, Aldo, Jeremy Irons plays his brother, Rodolfo, and then Jared Leto plays Paolo, who is Aldo son, Maurizio's cousin. Before I say anything else about this movie, regardless of how I felt about it, regardless of how any movie critics felt about it, I don't think anyone can deny how strong of a cast this is. Just seeing them all lined up on the movie poster is so striking and powerful. Lady Gaga definitely brings a pizzazz to this movie, as you would expect she would. She's Lady Gaga. Her costumes are great. She definitely looks the part. She is beautiful in this movie. She's very emotive. She's dynamic. And she certainly stays in character. You could actually argue that she probably stayed in character a little bit too well. She has publicly said that she didn't leave the role of Patrizia even when they weren't filming. Before filming, after filming, she said that she was inside of that role for the better part of a year and a half. And kind of as a result, she's a lot in this movie. I mean, I won't deny that she's fantastic to watch. I really enjoyed her in this role. But I'm not the only person to notice that the accent wasn't the greatest. And because she's doing so much more than the other actors pretty much every single time she's on screen, it grates. And I know that that was an intentional choice on her part. She wanted to make her character feel as though she would never truly belong in the Gucci family. So I know that was a choice, but I don't think it hit exactly in the way she intended. I mean, Patrizia as a person was very over the top, but not really in that way. And because her performance was so big, so over the top, I do think it really drowned out Adam Driver's performance. I find him to be pretty flat and boring to begin with. I know a lot of people love him. I swear most of what he does in this movie is just smile with glasses on. I didn't feel any of the real Maurizio's cravings for freedom, his charm, his wit, his stubbornness, his cowardice, his ability to win over businessmen in a meeting where he's talking about his vision for Gucci. I mean, the real Maurizio had these lines that he would deliver about where he wanted the company to go and how it was stagnating. He had all of these things that he would do. And I don't think the script reflected that. And I don't think Adam Driver's performance embodied him. He is elevated by the rest of the ensemble, though. 
I mean, Jared Leto is Paulo. He's the comic relief throughout this movie. And he's definitely very entertaining to watch. He is basically unrecognizable. I went to the theater with my husband. And my husband did not recognize that that was Jared Leto for the first half of the movie. So he's very successful in disguising himself and just being absorbed into that role. But my favorite performances are definitely from Al Pacino and Jeremy Irons. I thought they were so perfect as the elder Gucci brothers, particularly Al Pacino. I thought he was so perfect as Aldo. I had the ability to compare him against the real Aldo, who I learned about in the book. And I thought he just so embodied who Aldo was. Even in just the little bit that we get from him, I felt like he was that character. If he had been given more screen time, if more things from the real Aldo had been brought into the movie, he could have shined even more. He's Al Pacino. There are a lot of differences between the book, the real events, and the movie. That's probably to be expected. The movie is inspired by true events. It was never intended to be entirely faithful. But you might be wondering what inside of the movie was actually true. And since I know the true events, because I've already read the book, I thought I would share some selections of those with you. First of all, as I expected they would, they condensed the character list. So Paolo is only one of Maurizio's cousins. He actually had four cousins, one female cousin, and three male cousins. All of the male cousins had ownership stakes within Gucci, and they played a role in the story. And then Patrizia and Maurizio, they actually had two daughters. We're only shown their one daughter, Alessandra, but they actually had a second daughter named Allegra. And in the real story, while Maurizio was kind of being groomed by Aldo to take over, it was much less the become my son thing that the movie showed. I mean, Aldo had three sons of his own. And while Paolo was actually a really big pain in the butt, he did have two other sons and he definitely favored all of his sons before Maurizio. And alliances were constantly shifting in a way that the movie definitely does show. But I had a feeling the movie would go down that path of kind of bringing Maurizio into the mix so that we as viewers could get a good background on the company of Gucci. That was a really good opportunity for them to show the history of the company in a non-info dumpy, very appropriate feeling kind of way. And Patrizia, she had a whole lot less to do with all of this than the movie implies. It's a lot more dramatic to think that there was this outsider woman moving all the chess pieces, setting family members against one another. That's really not how it went down. In the early days, yes, she was pushing Maurizio to become more involved in the business, encouraging him to come out of his shell. But once he did so, and he decided that he wanted to take the company in a new direction, he decided that his family members were getting in his way, then he was doing all that scheming on his own. And they were countering his scheming with their own scheming all on their own. That was their drama. And she didn't really have anything to do with that. In the true story, Maurizio actually had a long saga of trying to keep a hold of Gucci before he was eventually forced out. And he was forced out like a full two years before his murder. And I had a feeling that the movie was going to move those two events closer in time to one another. But I thought they were going to do that in order to introduce an element of mystery into the story. Like, was Maurizio murdered because they wanted him out of Gucci? Or did his ex-wife do it? I thought they were going to introduce that. And then the murder itself ended up being such a small part of this movie. So I guess in that way, it's very similar to the book. But I still feel like that was a real missed opportunity. But even though there are a number of differences, I was actually surprised to see how much they pulled directly from the book, directly from the true story. I mean, Maurizio did marry Patrizia against his father's wishes. She did initially want him for his name, but ended up falling very deeply in love with him. She was very jealous of the other women he had in his life after her. Maurizio did force his family out of the Gucci company by using InvestCorp. He was accused of forging his father's signature to transfer those shares and avoid the inheritance tax. Aldo did did go to jail for tax evasion, even down to Patrizia's diary entry on the day of Maurizio's murder. 
a lot of the true story is in here, which I think ended up being good and bad. Of course, especially being a book lover like myself, you want to think that a movie is going to take a lot from its source material and it's going to be faithful to the book. But in this case, it's being faithful to a book that tried to do too much and ended up just kind of jumbled. And as a result, I think the movie suffered from the same thing. I think if they both would have tried to do less, they would have achieved more. But then again, I do think there are a number of things this movie did really well. I think all the emotion tied up in all the relationships felt very real, very potent. I have said it before, but Al Pacino was my favorite person in this movie. And the series of scenes leading up to him losing the company, I mean, it was just heartbreaking. I really liked that they highlighted just how hard Patrizia was holding on to the name Gucci, even after her marriage was obviously over. That is something that she tried to do, but I'm glad they underlined it because I think it says so much about her. And also the movie draws a line under something that I don't think the book does very well. And that's the fact that there are no more Gucci's left at Gucci right now. So is this movie enjoyable to watch? I personally think so. It's a long one. It's two hours and 37 minutes long. But even though it's paced kind of strangely, like certain things get a lot of time and then other important things don't get a lot of time, lots of weird choices. But even though that's going on, it absolutely flew by. I was definitely very absorbed in the story, probably because there was so much going on. The costumes were great, but honestly, for a movie about a fashion house, there was surprisingly little fashion besides what the characters were wearing. Like I didn't feel like fashion had all that much of a part of the movie up until the very end. There are some cameos from some famous fashion figures, which is very exciting. I just wish there had been more of it. I also found myself wishing after we left the theater and I had been thinking about this movie some more, I wish this movie had had some more distinct styling. I think this movie, but with the styling of I, Tanya would have just been spectacular. This movie is getting mixed reviews right now, and mine is also a mixed review because I don't think this movie was a failure. I enjoyed watching it. I don't regret paying to go see it, but I also didn't feel fully satisfied by it in kind of the same way I didn't feel fully satisfied by the book. I felt like they both made promises that they didn't end up delivering on. And so this won't be an instance where I can pick a favorite of the two because I don't have one. If you are interested in the book, the movie, maybe even both, I have a little bit of unconventional advice coming from a book person. I would actually suggest you watch the movie first because if you find yourself wanting more details about the story or specifically if you want to learn more about the Gucci business, then I think it would be good for you to pick up the book. But I think the movie would stimulate that appetite for you. And as long as you know what you're getting into with the book, I think you have a better chance of enjoying it. So that's my recommendation. But if you do pick up the book, be sure to get that newly issued paperback because there are updates from the last 20 years at the back of the book. And they are fascinating. So those were my thoughts on the House of Gucci book and movie. If you have experienced or want to experience either or both, please do let me know in the comment section below. If you would like to see more videos like this in which I compare a book to its movie adaptation, be sure to click on the playlist that is in the description box below and up in the cards. If you'd like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on a variety of places around the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram, the two places I'm the most active. The links to everywhere you can find me will be at the bottom of the description box below. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.